And uh, I'm hoping that tonight, um, feel free to ask questions as we go through it. You don't have to wait to the end. There's a lot of new things that I, I want to show you. And, and if it's really caught your eye at that time, ask me the question right then and there. And uh, we'll just go through it together at your pace. So uh, we talked a little bit about me already. Uh, if you're on Twitter, this is my Twitter handle. It's at Colleen underscore Young. And uh, I have been a community manager of, of several different uh, communities. My first one uh, started back in 2006 called Sharing Strength, and that was specifically for women with breast cancer. Uh, currently, I'm the manager of a virtual hospice in Portail Palliatif, which is an online community for people facing uh, end of life. Um, and then I, as you know, am at Elixir, which is the survivorship program at the Princess Margaret Cancer Centre. The other community is Healthcare Social Media Canada, and that's that acronym in the red there, H-C-S-M-C-A, and that's a Twitter community, and it has that hashtag that helps to congregate um, all of these different, very disparate people within the healthcare system, from patients to providers, from researchers to policy makers. So I'll give you an introduction uh, to a lot of different social media tools and communities that might be helpful for you, often drawing on these areas that, uh, that I'm working in currently, but not only. So the next thing I'd like to do is ask about you. I'd just like to know in the room, uh, how many of you uh, go to friends, neighbors, and family when you have a health issue, just to talk to them what they've done, what remedies they've maybe come up with? Great. And how many of you go to the internet to look up solutions, perhaps? And how many of you look for people on the internet for discussions of experiences, so not just information, but perhaps support? Uh, forums and other other means of, of finding out sort of the friends and family but online if you will great so that helps me um, how many of you are independent of health um, are using Facebook Twitter and online forums yeah um, what about YouTube and blogs, reading them or writing them. Great, well that just gives me a little bit of an idea of um, who I'm talking with and, uh, and your experiences. I just want to start out this conversation with a quote from Susan Sontag. Susan wrote, everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and in the kingdom of the sick. And although we prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged, at least for a spell, to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. So what do we do when we're sort of thrown into this kingdom of the sick? Well, we do everything that we can do to get out of there. And so that's when we band together. That's when we go to our friends and family, when we go to the health professionals, we text, we telephone, and some of us go online. And this is now the power of the social web, is that we now have a much larger pool of people to access when we want to get out of the kingdom of the sick. So the social web is not actually social media. So social media are these spaces, the blogs, the Facebooks, the Twitter, the discussion forums. And I like to use the analogy of the playground or the park. So the Facebook, the Twitter, the YouTubes, they're like the park, but they're nothing without the people. And if you take away playgrounds away from parents, then you would be doing a really big disservice to the community. Because if you have a child, where do you get a lot of your health and well-being information? It's from the playground. It's like, did yours throw up that much when they ate? 
right? And have you ever seen that color of poop? Is that okay? That we get real information from other people, from their experiences. And so this is what social web is. It's relationships, it's connections, it's ideas, it's people. And we have just now a bigger playground and a bigger community. And I'd like to maybe show you tonight how we can navigate that bigger world. Because what we realize that healthcare professionals are still our go-to person when we need help with our health. But there's an awful lot of living that we do in between appointments. And there's a lot that we can do ourselves to get ourselves out of the kingdom of the sick, to navigate within the kingdom of the sick, and to live the best quality of life if we have to stay in the kingdom of the ill. And this is a quote from one of the communities that I managed that this forum is like a big cozy blanket when I need someone to lean on. What I'd like to do throughout the presentation this evening is, first of all, dis, uh, define what is an online community, which we've done a little bit already. What type of community are you looking for? Because they're not all created equal. Where can you find them? How can you share safely online? And how do you even get started? So there's not really any universally accepted definition for an online community, but this is the most concise and, and one that I really like. I think it says it all. It's basically a group of people who share a strong common interest, form relationships, and interact online. And it's that really strong common interest that brings us together as a community. Because if we're just congregating, you can have a lot of people commenting, for example, on a Globe and Mail article. But is that a community? They're not really interacting, right? So it might have an interest in that particular article. And they are online, perhaps. But they're not really interacting, and they're not um, bonded with this sense of community around a strong common interest. There are many different types of communities, and for the purposes of this discussion, I'd just like to talk about communities of circumstance, communities of action, and communities of practice. And I have some examples for all of those. Um, basically, for if you're thrown into a cancer world, um, this is what would be considered a community of circumstance. It's not really your choice. It's something that uh, was imposed upon you and uh, then made you find a strong common interest because you're interested in your health and well-being. Community of action, um, that might be something that uh, you want to change a behavior. So an action in order to stop smoking, for example, and you work together with peers to get that support. Um, it can also mean to advocate for change. Um, a good example of that would be to uh, change um, the inequality of access to cancer drugs from province to province. If that's something that's affected you, maybe you'll work with the community um, to advocate for that change. To fundraise is another community of action. Communities of practice uh, is a good example is Healthcare Social Media Canada, the one that I introduced at the beginning, where you're actually collaborating and working together. Um, researchers do this a lot, and, uh, and there are more and more tools uh, to do that online. So we'll delve into those a little bit. Also to think about what you're looking for. So when you, we'll sort of look at all of these points when we look at some of the examples that I have tonight um, to, to keep you safe. So you should look at who is the um, creator of the community or who is the funder of the community. How is it being run and what, what are their motives for, for driving this community? Is it about the people or do they maybe have an ulterior motive? Um, who's moderating it and how are they moderating? Are they keeping it safe? Uh, what are your privacy options? Very important that you know it's, it's okay to be open, but do you know that it is being shared? Um, and how active is the community? I think that um, it's really important if you're going to seek help online and you want to put out a, a really important question about your health, 
you're going to want to know that that community is, is alive, that there's people there. I mean, think about it. If you go to a party, um, what room is going to be populated first in the house? The kitchen, right? So if you want to have conversation, you're going to go into the kitchen because you know there, that's where you're going to meet people. So you don't want to go to a community that doesn't have a kitchen. Um, does the personality of the community suit you? They're, not, again, not created equal. Um, some of them may be too Pollyannish. Um, I know that this is um, sometimes a pro problem when uh, you are maybe in a cancer survivorship community where it's um, a lot about survival, moving on, and, uh, but you've got metastatic cancer. So moving on has a different definition for you. Uh, that that com you might not feel welcome in that community. So it's something to look for. And then you want to rate the quality of the information. That's extremely important. Um, how relevant is it? How credible is it? How accessible and how timely? So let's look at some of these things as we look through some of the examples. So communities of circumstance. One of my favorite communities is uh, cancerconnection.ca. This is the community that was started by the Canadian Cancer Society about two years ago. It was really um, welcome in the Canadian scene of uh, information and support. And they have discussion forums and blogs for all cancers. And uh, so I, I welcome you to go on to cancerconnection.ca. It's a bilingual community as well. There's Parlons Cancer. And uh, it's moderated by a team of moderators. And I just wanted to show you some examples of um, how it's important to look when you look for discussion forums if you can find out how and why they moderate. It's um, nice to know that somebody's there keeping the community safe. So uh, this is Canadian Virtual Hospice. And uh, we outline very clearly why we moderate and how we moderate. And that we um, don't interfere with the conversations, but that we're making, making sure that they're safe, that we are reading the, um, the posts, that the posts get uh, show up uh, right away, so it's Im immediate posting, and that we also rely on the community to report back when there's in inappropriate posts. And so we um, allow, that it says here, the message you post will show up right away. We don't screen them before they go live. While we monitor all posts, we also rely on our members to tell us about any inappropriate content or behavior. So it's really important that the moderators also behind the scenes are making sure that the community members feel invested enough in the community to um, monitor along with them. And, and this has been very successful and it's the same um, policy for the Cancer Connection as well. They have very similar rules. Macmillan Cancer Support in the UK is another example and they use the same uh, type of monitoring. And uh, so it's a, a great place for support throughout the cancer journey. I'd like to talk about closed versus open a little bit as well. So this is the um, Kidney Cancer Canada's uh, entry page to their community, but you can't see the discussion forums. So you have to be a member before you can read the, the messages. Whereas on Cancer Connection and Virtual Hospice, you don't have to be a member to be able to read the messages. There's pros and cons to, to both of those, and it really depends on your preference, on your comfort level with that. So what you can't tell at first glance before you sign up for Kidney Cancer Canada, is it an active community or not? So you have to decide, do I want to fill out the registration information only to find out that it's a ghost town and that no one is there. So that's just something to, to be aware of. Whereas if you go to a Cancer Connection, I'm not registered, I'm not signed in. Um, well, I am registered, but I'm not signed in right now. And I can go to the discussion forums and I can read what people have written. So here's a topic about chronic pain management. 
And the philosophy be behind this is that there are many people that maybe uh, don't want to post but can still learn from this conversation. And so that is the philosophy behind the Cancer Connection is that this is really rich information that's being shared. And the um, rule of thumb is that about 100 uh, reads compared to uh, one post. So the ratio is one to 100. So when you're sharing some of this great information, um, you can take comfort in knowing that you're probably helping up to 100 other people as well. So virtual hospice uh, runs in the same uh, principle that you can read the, the posts right away. So the discussion forums are open and uh, a lot of them are caregivers and it is for caregivers and for people at end of life through to loss and grief. And so this is the type of um, discussion forum that you want to see. You can see here that there are people who are, are talking and the dates are very recent. And so you know that this um, community is active. You can see that people are responding and that people are talking. So another model is uh, this one, Cancer Chat Canada. And this is a closed community as well, but it's professionally led. So this is a 10-week session. It's peer-to-peer -peer sharing, but once a week they all get together at the same time, which is called synchronous support, and they um, are actually coached by a, a professional um, facilitator and they can have discussions with one another um, during those 10 weeks as well. And so then they often will graduate, if you will, if you want to call it that, but once their 10 week session is uh, done, they'll often seek support, continued support on Cancer Connection, for example, or virtual hospice or, or other s such um, support groups. One other uh, example that I wanted to show you that I just have here is uh, Patients Like Me. I don't know if you've ever heard of Patients Like Me, but this is then going the absolute opposite extreme, whereby they say in their terms of uh, agreement that your, what you share will be data mined, will be actually used for research. And they, people, um, they said right on their website here, they just published a paper that says their survey shows the vast majority of people with health conditions are willing to share their health data. And that they do so on patients like me, talking, tracking their symptoms, tracking how they feel, um, and sharing with others, and knowing that this is going to be then uh, used for research. So, so really quite e extreme differences and it really is your preference. A lot of people take comfort in patients like me knowing that they're sharing with thousands and thousands of people to advance research for, for new um, treatments, uh, new symptom management drugs and, uh, and they realize that their personal identity will be removed from that information but that it will be shared with uh, drug companies and with um, uh, researchers, so a, a vast array of different people. So the other social networks that I wanted to look at tonight are uh, the, more the um, open networks. So these are not owned by uh, a particular group, but rather are just open platforms that people are using more and more to share on. And the uh, biggest thing about staying safe in these communities is that you know what your privacy um, options are and that you uh, put them on there um, because there's not an overarching moderator keeping you safe on, on these communities. So communities of action uh, often can use a lot of these platforms and uh, I mentioned a few of them uh, with uh, Smokers Helpline um, and um, so to change behavior, Elixir Kitchen is another one, and uh, the uh, fundraising and uh, for advocacy is uh, the campaign to control cancer. So blogs, there are different types of blogs. Blogs are often a personal journey. 
So you can write about your own personal journey and then and read other people's blogs. Um, one example that I have here up on the screen is uh, Chemo Brain, and uh, Anne Marie has written about her journey with um, cancer. And uh, she's actually developed quite a community of followers who exchange on her blogs. But that's always starting by one person's journey and with comments. So it's a different type of community whereby one person is always leading the conversation. Uh, there are many organizations that also have their blogs. Uh, Wellspring, for example, um, has a blog and uh, they talk about a lot of different things. Um, so they have exercise and nutrition, work and money, and uh, finances, a section also for families and caregivers. So this is their blog that you can explore. Um, the Elixir blog, we have um, a number of different bloggers contributing to our blog. So there's spiritual care in here, again, health and nutrition, as well as uh, um, uh, we have a comedian who blogs uh, about the cancer experience, so quite a, a wide range of different bloggers. So you can either go to a blog of an organization or people who are blogging about their personal journey. Videos are less of community building, so for social media it's more of uh, learning. There are comments on videos, but they tend not to really build a community. It's a social media platform that is um, more about sharing but not community building. I've put up a few here. Um, there's the cancer related fatigue is from Dr. Mike Evans in Toronto. I don't know if you've seen his videos. Um, you might want to look that up. He has some incredible um, videos that uh, are withdrawing and uh, have you seen them? And uh, anyway, they're, they're a wider range of, of topics. Uh, the Elixir Kitchen has a lot of videos about healthy eating. We have at Elixir a wellness chef and a dietitian, and they do a cooking show every week. So they put up their cooking videos, uh, their recipes, uh, with a lot of nutrition specifically for cancer wellness. And uh, Elixir also has other videos here. I've just got an example of some of the uh, breathing exercises that one can do. So uh, we have lymphedema massage and, and a lot of uh, things for helping with um, cancer wellness. Facebook is an interesting beast. There's uh, three different ways of, of sharing, I'm going to say. Um, you can share with family and friends uh, and your personal networks. Uh, some people find that perhaps some of the health experiences that they want to share, they want to find other people like them with that experience of having that condition. And they don't necessarily want to share with family and friends. So on Facebook, there's the option to look for groups and to join a group, for example, if you um, have inflammatory breast cancer, you might want to find a particular group of women who have inflammatory breast cancer or prostate cancer. Um, and you can simply search on Facebook for, for that type of group. The other thing that one can do on Facebook is to like pages. And pages then are uh, from either institutions or companies that you might be interested in. Uh, for example, Wellspring again, uh, the Canadian Cancer Society. Um, the one that I have pictured here is Facing Cancer Together. And they also have discussion forums and blogs. They have a Facebook and they have a, a Twitter feed. So a lot of times you can get just uh, some great information on there. And again, um, less of a community building. You can comment maybe on the posts, but the more the community is uh, in the group pages or the network that you build in your personal pages. And then we come to Twitter. So Twitter is an, an interesting uh, beast on its own. Twitter is um, really quite a messy place, can be quite a messy place, until you put a harness around it. And it's, um, you know, who is on Twitter? Well, there are patients on Twitter, caregivers, providers, um, advocates, 
advocacy see groups, uh, institutions, researchers, policymakers, CEOs of hospitals, uh, really everybody is there. And so I find that uh, it's hard to get started. Who do you start to follow? Well, it really depends on how you want to use Twitter. So specifically looking at how to use it for health, um, I find that the one way to really get started is by the hashtag. So a hashtag is this number sign and then it will, what's called aggregate all the tweets in that hashtag. So we'll talk a little bit about healthcare hashtags. Um, this is a site called Simpler, S-Y-M-P-L-U-R, and they actually have an index of all the healthcare hashtags that are used. So you can Look at this long list of healthcare hashtags. And it really has a hashtag for almost every health condition, um, for every health symptom. Uh, it can be divided perhaps by group, so caregivers, or um, by med students. And uh, this is a great place to get started. Some of these hashtags <laughs> Um, are also attached to a chat. And so there'll be a designated time, um, weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, where people will come together to talk about that particular topic. A really popular one is breast cancer social media. They meet every when, uh, Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, that brings together a lot of different patients, bloggers, uh, healthcare providers, and they'll have a set topic to talk about um, in, in that particular week. And this is the Healthcare Social Media Canada's uh, format as well. So they, we meet every Wednesday at 1 p.m. and on the last Wednesday of the month at 9 p.m. And uh, they talk about uh, different things in social media and healthcare, making healthcare more open and transparent. Where to find communities online? So it's, it's not that easy to find some of them. It, it can be difficult to, to find. Um, but Google is your first biggest friend, of course, and, or another search engine. To um, healthline.ca and caregiver exchange have lists of different communities. You can look at your national cancer organizations. And then Webicina is a great uh, place to look at. They have in multiple languages uh, social media resources for um, many, many different disease states and uh, they list online communities, they list blogs, they list people to follow on Twitter, and they uh, list forums, I said already, YouTube, so um, videos, collections. So it really curates um, all of the social media uh, channels that are out there. And there's a Canadian website for all Canadian, or you can um, define it by disease state and get international um, social media resources on Webicina. There's also a list lead by a Journey Beyond Breast Cancer. She started to uh, collect a list of online patient support groups. And so these things are moving so quickly though that they're really hard to keep updated. And uh, so these are just some of the resources where to get started. These are just some of the Elixir properties. So Elixir, I'll just explain, is actually an acronym. It's the Electronic Living Lab of Interdisciplinary Cancer Survivorship Research. <laughs> 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 and uh, it is the survivorship program at Princess Margaret. As I said, we have the blog, we have Facebook, we have our uh, kitchen website, and then Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest as well. So how can we use all of these things safely? I think I've given some indication of, about looking at, you know, who created the website, how is it funded, um, how is it being monitored. Um, but there's other things that you can do uh, when you're on the open websites as well is 
to know the terms of use and the privacy conditions. I think I've mentioned that several times. Also to keep your passwords confidential so no one can log on as you. Uh, to be yourself even when posting anonymously. We used to um, always advise people, you know, you don't have to use your real name, you can protect your own identity. But more and more as, as social media is becoming ubiquitous, people are using their own name and sharing quite freely and openly about their health conditions. Um, just know what you're doing when you're doing that and that, um, you know, Google is out there watching everything that you post. Um, so it's something to definitely be aware of. Uh, I post a lot about cancer. I post a lot about end of life. Yesterday I was um, writing on Bell Let's Talk for mental health. So God knows what Google thinks I have. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's, it, it, I do that because I really want to um, talk about these things and, and take away the stigma of these things, I don't think it necessarily means that I have every condition that I um, tweet about. Perhaps Google does think that, but for me it's more important that there's openness and sharing. But that might not be your situation. Perhaps uh, the condition that you have you don't want to share so openly. So you just need to make that decision for yourself. And remember that what you post online does stay there. It stays there forever. Um, it can be extremely helpful that it stays there forever, especially in discussion forums. When you're sharing on these discussion forums, some of the messages that are shared can help so many people long after uh, you've left that post there. Um, I, I see that happening on uh, virtual hospice all the time. In fact, just uh, yesterday we had a new member who started uh, writing to a post that had been inactive since 2010, but that was the one that, that spoke to her. I'm not sure how she dug that one up because it had been buried quite a bit, but that was the one that uh, spoke to her and, and I'm glad that that was there for her. Um, she had just lost her husband. We had some other posts, uh, threads that were active about that, but that was the one that, that uh, seemed to resonate with her. Um, log off when you leave your computer again and uh, report misuse because it does go to somebody and uh, people can do spam and people do troll and uh, if we work together to uh, shut them down then uh, we can stay ahead of that. Some of the other things that I also like to look out for is, is some of the tone that you hear on um, networks that are sharing. What I've often noticed as a moderator is that people will often say, well, I know everyone's different, but for me, it was like this. Or, I'm not a doctor, but what happened for me was. And I think those are the types of uh, comments that uh, you can trust more than, oh, you really have to take tea tree oil. That's the only way to, to fix that. Or um, medical marijuana. Is, is the thing that you have to do. Um, I don't think that, I think there may be a place for medical marijuana and tea tree oil, but uh, tea tree oil, but I don't want to be told that that's the cure-all. There's always snake oil salesmen, there always have been, but now we have, a, you know, a much wider net to cast. We're going to um, potentially meet all of them. And, uh, and so you can, uh, it's you for up to you to be able to discern t the um, personality of the community and um, to take everything with a grain of salt and not to replace it with um, the advice that you would get with your healthcare provider. What I do find on uh, social media and uh, discussion forums in particular is that there's an awful lot of um, help in understanding and courage to be able to talk to your healthcare provider. So often I see, oh, it's such a silly little question. I didn't dare bother my doctor about it. And other forum members will say, that's not silly at all. You know, make sure that you ask that question. And so it gives a lot of courage as well um, to, to be able to communicate with your doctor. So these are just some of the uh, quotes that I, I gathered 
from some of the forums that I've read. Of course, I could have had about 117 <laughs> easily, but then there would be none of them would be legible. I, I love the one in the dark brown here. Um, it's astonishing how words from a computer screen can make it actually possible to go through hell. And this was actually from a, a lady that uh, did the 10-week program on Cancer Chat Canada. So she got a lot of guided support and then she chose to join the community on virtual hospice. And uh, it was really rewarding to see how much it actually did help her um, to have that combined uh, facilitated discussion and then peer-to-peer -peer discussion with others going through the same condition. Because this is one of my favorite quotes, in between doctor's visits, we have a lot of life to live. So if I go back to um, some of these things, I just want to make sure that we, we've answered our questions that we started out with. I think we've defined what an online community is, what type of community you're looking for. So it's not always just the support. You may be further along in, in the engagement where you want to make change. And those are communities of action or communities of practice. Where you can find them, it's not easy, but uh, there are some tools out there to help you, and, and I'm happy to share those uh, websites um, when you, you post this online. And how you can do it safely, given a little bit of guidance for that, and uh, how to get started. So I hope that uh, we've answered those questions. Well, I think that concludes it then. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.